it may seem like I'm picking on fundamentalist evangelicals in this video at first and I, I don't want it to be viewed like that even though I'm mostly going to talk about the way they interpret the Bible and they interpret the Bible in such a way as they don't ever have to learn anything from it. It always confirms their original ideas and their original biases and, and you know it's not just evangelicals but I think most American Christians and otherwise are, are deeply and personally offended at the idea that they have anything important to learn about God or the Bible. I mean, they can learn some details, they're interested in things that confirm their existing beliefs, but as far as changing their mind on any big issue, it seems offensive to, to many of them, including those, honestly, who don't make a habit of studying the Bible in a, in a deep and serious way. Just, but they're you know, they're offended at the idea they've got it wrong. So, you know, I've tried to talk to my evangelical, evangelical fundamentalist friends, and I myself, I'm a, I consider myself a neo-fundamentalist. And here's what I mean by that. When it comes to early Genesis, for example, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the more scholarly-minded believers and unbelievers make fun of fundamentalists. And I, I will say this, in terms of what the narrative is saying in early Genesis, the fundamentalist evangelicals have it wrong. But in terms of what early Genesis is, they mostly have it right. And you may think, no, there's no way that could be, they could have that mostly right. There, there is a way, and it's the Christ-centered model. So, which is in other videos I'm not going to talk about tonight. So I, I really, I will have something to say to everybody, I think, by the end of this. But what I want to talk about today, because it, it came to me as a revelation for years, I was frustrated. I try to talk to my friends who are fundamentalist evangelicals, and again, I, I consider myself a neo-fundamentalist, about the message of the Bible and the message of Genesis and how it points to Christ. And I, I was getting nowhere. It just the information somehow could not go in. And... They would not see scriptures and, and follow through when I, when I tried to make an argument. And I, I was frustrated for years until finally I got into a discussion with one on a Facebook group. And he is from some sort of association up north. I got the idea he was, he was a professional Christian in some capacity. But he actually made a rule of it. He actually put rules on it. And I, I said, that's it. That's what they're doing. They may not consciously have that rule but that's the rule they're following. And it's the key to never having to change your mind about anything the Bible says. And so what I want to do is I want to share that. Maybe if you had the same issues I've had, that you can follow through and say, yeah, I recognize this. And here's what's going on here. Okay, so this is uh, how to read the Bible so that it always confirms what you originally believed in the first place. And you never have to learn anything. Here, let's start with the their golden rule that was explained to me in a Facebook group. Here is what the young earth creationist teacher said to me. He said that plain reading, which he called verbatim, really verbatim means word for word, is the most important biblical hermeneutic. In other words, the way of understanding the Bible is plain reading. And context never negates verbatim. That's the guiding principle that he uses in interpreting scripture. Because I was, you know, he was taking a sentence or a sentence, and I'll give you some examples. I'll give you some examples. And you've probably, this has probably happened to you if you've attempted to engage. Takes a sentence or a sentence fragment and says, see, it means what I'm saying. And you say, but look, read two more verses. And it says this, and they're going, nope, you're looking for context. They don't do that. They don't want to do that. Now, you may think that's a really shallow, self-focused way of looking at Scripture, but it allows them to what? To just see a reflection of what they want out of it. Because it, the Bible has a lot of words strung together. You know that? In lots of different combinations. And if you are willing to look and find enough segments of words, you can find seven or eight words strung together 
that seem to support whatever point you want to make. When people say, you know what, the Bible, you can make that say almost anything you want it to say, this is what they're talking about. It's really hard to do that if you study the Bible the way I'm saying to do it. Go back and look at the Hebrew. Go back and look at the surrounding, everything you can for context. It's, hard, it's really hard to make the Bible say anything you want it to say. But if you use the hermeneutic that I've bumped into and you've probably bumped into, yes, you can make the Bible say just about anything you want it to say because it has lots of words in it, different words strung together in different order, and if they just scan enough, they can pick a sentence fragment or a sentence, seven or eight words, that seem to say, if you ignore everything around it, if you ignore the Greek, ignore the Hebrew, you can find those sentence fragments that seem to support your original idea, whatever your original idea is. And so that's what they do, folks. That is the key to their understanding the Bible. They don't look for context. And this is why, let's see if this has happened to you. You know, you, you, you talk to your friend, and he has a verse that he counters what you're saying with, and you say, well, let's look a little deeper in this verse. Let's go earlier in the chapter and see where he's setting this up. And you start to dig into the verse, and instead of staying with you in the discussion, they do what? They go and they quote another verse to you. They don't want to hang around and thoroughly examine that one because that's looking for context. That's digging in and really trying to find out the meaning that the text itself is conveying. And that's not what they're after. They're looking to confirm the ideas that they brought into it. And so you can't, if you look too deeply into the text and try to fit it into the whole, you can't put yourself in there. The, the, what the word is really saying is trying to come out. But if you just say, you know what, I'm going to find seven or eight words that if you just take in by themselves seem to support what I'm saying. And I'm just going to stick with that. And if, if, if he tries to uh, show me that that has another context, I'm going to say that's invalid. We go word for word. We go verbatim. And I'm going to show you later on if it gets in their business, they don't go verbatim. So that they don't. By plain reading, they mean the ideas that I originally brought into this. That's all they mean by plain reading. It isn't what the text is saying, according to plain reading. I'll show you some examples, specific examples. So... What you do is you find yourself on this merry-go-round because they have another rule. He didn't tell me, but you'll see it as I go through this. You've heard the phrase quality over quantity, the idea that one really good thing is better than a whole bunch of bad things. They do it the opposite. It is quantity over quality. So if they can find uh, 10 different seven or eight word sentence fragments that they think supports their position, they beat you. You've only got three scriptures. They've got 15. But your scriptures are in context and theirs are not. But that doesn't matter because context doesn't count. I have the Christ-centered model. So to, to me, Adam's biblical role, Romans 5.14, is that he's a figure of Christ. And this founder of mankind versus founder of Messiah line, it's a pertinent question. But to them, there, there was no question. Adam's role in the Bible is to be the cell founder of humanity. And so I said, okay, show me where it says that. And I don't know how you feel about the issue, but, but that was the issue that we were talking about. And I want you to watch what they do and see if it, it fits with what I've been saying about how they view the Bible, how they interpret the Bible, and see if it is in a way that all it does, you look at the Bible just so it'll reflect you back at you if you use their hermeneutic. The only way to use a hermeneutic that subjects you to the Bible instead of the Bible to you is to look for context for everything. But they're not doing that. They're, going, they're saying verbatim, and you'll see that that doesn't even matter when push comes to shove. So let's take a look. What scriptures do they come up with? What do they say about it? So Acts was one place that he quoted, and I have separate videos about this, Acts 17, where it says, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell in the face of the earth, and hath determined the time before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. Now, that's what the King James Version says. Many versions don't say one blood. A couple say from one man. There's basically no original manuscripts that say one man there. They either say one blood, a few of them, the, the, uh, the Texas Receptus says one blood. 
most of them say nothing at all there. And you have to assume what the one is. So you could say of one ethnos, God made every ethnos on earth. In other words, it doesn't have to be one man. One blood doesn't have to be one man. In fact, if the Holy Spirit had wanted to teach that all men came from one man, that would be a great place to do it, right there. But the Greek word for man, anthropos, is not there. It's the Greek word for blood. If we say we're of one blood, that means we're kinfolk, but it doesn't necessarily mean we all came from one man. We share the same blood. And in fact, we know in the Bible, uh, God is able to raise up descendants of Abraham from these stones. And so, uh, but let me, let me get into his answer to that before I, before I go any further than that. But, and it was very hard for me to keep my composure with some of these accusations. But these people, are, they get defensive because their whole identity is wrapped up in a, believing certain things about the Bible. And if you show them the Bible is, is not saying that, even if you're showing them something better, you're, I'm not saying the Bible is false. I'm not saying that these events are not historical. I'm saying they've got the history wrong. I'm saying it's better than what they think. It points more to Christ than what they think. It's even more glorious for Christianity than what they're saying the Christ text says. But that doesn't matter if your identity is wrapped up in, well, good people are people that hold these certain positions about what the Bible says. Instead of looking at what the Bible says, it's the identity that's threatened. And so that's the reason, I think, for some of the harshness of the reaction. But what they said was, notice what it said, all peoples are of the same blood, which would be Adam's blood. That's what he said. Did you notice the flaw there? He says that the hermeneutic is not context, but plain reading and verbatim. It's not verbatim. He doesn't, when, it, when push comes to shove, they don't go verbatim. If he needs the word man to be in there, he puts it in there in his head and it's there, even if it's not there. That's, that's the problem. That's what I'm saying. It's not really verbatim. It's or its plain meaning means what I think it means, just off the top of my head, based on my context. I am the context. So this, I can see why he doesn't want to look for context. His own feelings, his own beliefs, that's all the context he wants. Because anything else might correct his view. And that's what they're trying to avoid. Because they're evil, not any more than the rest of us. It's because they're frightened and they, it's... They don't want their identity to be destroyed. So, but this other part I did take offense to. I tried to overlook it. It says, uh, you having multiple races of mankind, I don't. Like I said, uh, Jesus said, God could create descendants of Abraham from these stones. So what I'm saying is, if Adam was created later, he could be created of the same blood as everybody else that was out there. Because God can do that. You know, God is not limited so you having multiple races of mankind goes 100% contrary to this declaration. And, and it's actually a racist theology. You, Mr. Moore, are a racist. Well, you know, I, I'm not, and it really had nothing to do with that. So I just ignored that and tried to get him to deal with context. And uh, some of it, he was successful. He was showing me that, yes, the, the Texas Receptus does have blood there. And I... I was looking at some of the other texts that didn't. So he was successful in that. I learned something from that, and I'm, I'm glad of it. But he was still inserting the word man in there when it wasn't there. And he's claiming his hermeneutic was verbatim, but what he really means is plain reading, and plain reading is what's plain to him, what meaning he takes out of it, unbothered and unperturbed by what all the surrounding text says. Let's take a look at another one, and you'll get a better idea of what I mean. It just The pattern just keeps building. Okay, so this next passage is Romans 5.12. Perfect example of what I mean. It may step on some of your guys' toes as well, uh, but it's, it's the idea of how sin and death pass to all men. And St. Augustine had a view of it that was through physical inheritance. I don't think the text says that. I don't share that view. The Eastern, Eastern Orthodox churches do not share that view. Uh, I don't think the Mennonites share that view. The Lutherans and I think the Methodists say, well, okay, Augustine was right, but infant baptism takes away any guilt from Adam's sin, and we baptize infants, so we don't have to deal with it. So it, it's, it's hardly unanimous, but 
Let's take a look at what the actual text says. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's the reason. It wasn't because we inherited from Adam. It was because all sinned. Now, if Adam was in some state that offered us protection, you know, like Christ offers us protection, and he lost that state, and then we have to stand or fall on our own, we're in trouble because we all sin. And, and when we have awareness of it, it produces death. But I, I, let me not get into that right now. I want to talk about his answer to that, and let's go from there. Okay, so he says, If all men have sinned, not being of Adamite blood, why did death pass unto all of them? Folks, read verse, that verse again and look at his question. It literally says why death passed on all men. Because all sinned. But he is so hung up on the Augustinian view of this passage, which I've heard some scholars say that Augustine was even reading a bad translation of the text when he came up with this doctrine. That he can't see what the text is plainly saying, even though he's claiming verbatim is more important than context, he can't see what's plainly written there. He asked the question, well, if they're not descended from Adam, then how did death pass unto all of them? It just says it in the verse very plainly, because all sinned, not because they inherited anything from Adam. So, you know, the true hermeneutic he's using is what he's calling plain reading, and plain reading just means what he thinks it means based on him being the context. He is the context, and he doesn't brook or tolerate any other context, such as what surrounding passages are saying or what the actual verbatim words in the passage are saying. So that, that's one example, but there's more. So let's look at a, a few more of these just to really drive home the point. So again, because they have another rule that quantity beats quality, if he can throw up a bunch of verses that don't really make the point, he still wins, even if I have two or three verses that make my point. And, and never mind, I, I talk about some of those things in other videos where I'm giving my side of it, but here I'm just asking the question, what is the scriptural case for your side of it? And some of the verses he gave were Genesis 3, verse 20, and, and these he didn't really comment on a lot, as if it was so obvious what they were saying that no commentary or no discussion was necessary. Uh, and the man called his wife's name Eve, for she hath been mother of all living. He's using Young's literal translation. The King James shortens that and says, for she was the mother of all the living. Okay? So in his mind, that settles it. Eve was the mother of all the living. So, again, literally, according to him, there were only two people alive, and she wasn't the mother of either of them, was she? So what can this statement mean? Well, the, the plain reading means that she got, uh, Adam is just like stopping his conversation and making an out-of-the-blue statement about the biological origins of humanity. No, he's not. This has to be connected to the promise of the seed in verse 15 and the, what the New Testament and the rest of the Bible says about these things. Uh, in other words, Christ is the seed that crushed the serpent's head. And the living are in Christ. Our life is in Christ. The New Testament teaches things about this. But they're just disconnecting everything. Because connecting things provides context. It also provides glorious proof that the Bible is, is a coherent whole, even though it was written over a long period of time by many authors. But, no, that's not important. The, the, what is the main thing? The main thing is confirming my existing beliefs, making sure I never have to change my mind about anything, I never have to experience any personal growth, I can just keep believing what I believe, no need to search. The Apostle Paul said he was letting go of what lies behind and reaching forward to go what lies ahead so that he might know Christ. Well, they don't have to do any of that. They're already there. They're ahead of the Apostle Paul. So, uh, you know, this... What, it, uh, liter what would it mean literally and verbatim is that she was the mother of all the living.
but she wasn't literally. She wasn't verbatim. So you have to look at that verse as, as kind of what, as a faith statement, a statement of faith, saving faith by Adam. He believed God's promise. Adam, Eve, you have blown it, but she's going to bear a seed, and the seed is going to fix it all. And that's what Adam, and the living are going to be in him. That's what Adam is saying here. He, the Lord God gave a promise, and Adam is counting it as if it had already happened. You know, just like Abraham did, just like God did when he said to Abraham, I've made you the father of many nations, when he didn't even have any children yet. God's talking past tense. I've done it. So that, that's the kind of thing, that's saving faith. So let's, let's go on to the next one. Luke 3.38. This is a genealogy of Jesus. The son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And that's it, as if that, that answers the question. Because in his mind, Adam is the only man. So it's... The, circle, the tight circle is complete, and really it, it doesn't say anything about whether there were other men out there. That God created other men. It doesn't say anything about that. It just traces Christ's genealogy back to Adam to show everybody that Christ was a descendant of Adam. And that's more important than what I'm saying. I'm saying Christ, as a descendant of Adam, could inherit the mantle of Adam, which was to be the representative of of humanity before God. And Luke thought it was important. If all men descended from Adam, would it even be necessary to take Christ's genealogy all the way back to Adam? Not at all. It would be assumed. But Luke doesn't assume that. There's another verse. 1 Timothy 2, 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Do you see how ridiculous it gets, friends? He takes those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words, totally out of context. Obviously, it is, you don't even have to look at the surrounding passage. What it's saying was, Adam was formed first relative to Eve. It isn't saying anything about Adam as the first human being. It's saying Adam was formed, the man was formed first, then the woman was formed. And he's trying to make a relationship, say something about the relationship between men and women and I have a, a good video on some of that too. But my point is, this just gets ridiculous. When they start saying, see, that is evidence from the Bible. So there's so many scriptures that say Adam was the first man. This verse doesn't say that. Neither do the other two. Neither do any of them, they say. They're just grabbing sentence fragments, short stretches that are a single sentence that in their minds, support what they're saying. Therefore, you know, it, it, it's got to be what you're saying. And I think we saw that back with the accusations of racism. Not only, they take your words according to their own context and don't ask you for further meaning because they're not going to treat you any better than they treat the Word of God. It, if they're doing that to the Word of God, they're going to do it to you too. So let, let's take a look at a couple more. This is in 1 Corinthians 15, and here he quoted this whole verse, that are these verses I've got up here, and I guess you could say, well, Mark, he's quoting more than just a sentence fragment or a single sentence there. He is, but he's not seeing that within the passage he's quoting, it shows that his interpretation of the sentence fragment that he really has in mind is not true. So he's looking at it in 1 Corinthians 15, 40, verse 45, so also it has been written, the first man Adam became a living creature. Stop. The first man Adam. There you go. That Adam was the first man. It says it right there in black and white, Mark. That's what it says, but similar to the previous passage where it says first Adam and then Eve, you know, if you go on, you see what it's really saying. You, you find first has a context. The last Adam is for a life-giving spirit, but that which is spiritual is not first, but that which was natural. Afterwards, that which is spiritual. The first man is out of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord out of heaven. You see, Jesus is the second man in this passage. Adam is the first man. Jesus is the second man. Was Jesus the second human being God ever created? No. 
was Jesus the second sole founder of the human race? No. I mean, he's a brother to us rather than a father, according to very many passages of Scripture. And in him, we can have access to the father, but he's not the father. So he and the father are one. Yes, they're because they're of the same nature, but they're not of the same person is, is what the uh, classic you know, Trinitarian belief is, which I fully adhere to. In fact, the Christ-centered model, I would say, is super Trinitarian in outlook. But you, you, I think you can see the point, even just within these few, few verses, he quoted all the verses, but he really only cared about that one sentence fragment. The rest of the verse contradicts what he thinks that sentence fragment meant, but he's still going with it. In fact, it gets worse than that, because if you back up earlier in the chapter, Paul has a long argument, and it starts by saying, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So Paul has an argument that goes all the way back to these other verses where he says, here's your first man, Adam, here's your second man, Christ. And he's simply continuing that through the end of the chapter. He's not making a statement about the biological origins of humanity. He's making a statement about the original way of doing things in Adam, with Adam as our representative, versus Christ, with Christ as our representative, with our life in him. So it, it really is not a statement about biological human origins at all, and you can tell that just by looking at the passage he quoted, okay, because Christ is the last Adam. You know, Adam's the first man, Adam, then Christ is the last Adam. Adam is the first, Christ is the second. It's not talking about of all humanity. It's talking about a comparison of the two natures or ways in this passage. So, let me sum up and also add just a little bit about other ways of looking at the Bible. Some of you who are not fundamentalist Christians may say, yeah, that's right. Mark really showed them up. He showed and punched through the flaws in what they're doing. And I did. But again, I, I don't want to just say they've got something to learn. We've all got something to learn. I adopted my view of early Genesis when I was in my 50s. I changed who I was and, and my belief about what the narrative was saying. And I, don't, I think there's other people that need to, and there's other ways to get it wrong besides the way they are doing it. The way they're doing it is wrong. They need to repent, but really we all do. And in fact, they are maybe wrong about what Scripture is saying, but they're mostly right about what the Scripture is. And many uh, would-be scholarly Christians, they have a different view. They say, well, no, we, we can only look at the Bible in the context of uh, what the audience of the day could have gotten out of it. Now, when it comes to early Genesis, I don't even believe they really knew who the audience of the day was. So what they have to do is they have to Imagine they know the audience of the day and imagine they know the limits of that audience's knowledge. And then they take their, their hermeneutic is to take meaning just from that. And that's, that's wrong. That is, it's very wrong. Besides not knowing you know, who the audience of the day was, the people that wrote the Bible were not the average people of their day. They were people that the Holy Spirit spoke to and revealed things to. You can't determine their knowledge by, oh, this is what we think a typical person of the day would. In fact, what you're doing is a more sophisticated version of what the young earth creationists are doing. You're just, instead of your own gut supplying the context, and you don't need to look at the rest of the Bible for context, you're coming up with this straw man, this, oh, this is, an, this is average Habib of 1900 or BC or 1000 BC, Here's what we've decided he could have known, and we're going to make him the filter through which we see all this stuff. Well, that's nonsense. It's, it's total nonsense. You know, the Apostle Paul said, whenever Moses is read to this very day, there's a veil that lies over the eyes of his countrymen. Christ and the Apostles are the Hebrews that we should be listening to, not this 
hypothetical average Hebrew of 1000 BC that we decide what we think he knows and, and we decide what the limits of his knowledge are. So there's, there's more ways to get it wrong. They have, uh, and, and some people are saying, well, uh, the Bible is not really trying to say anything about uh, you know, material origins. It's more just about making a theological point or what have you. That's not how Christ and the apostles believed. If you go look at the rest of the Bible, it doesn't support that view of the Bible. So there is plenty of room for improvement to go around. And, and really my wish, I'm, I hope my frustration didn't come off as being too belittling. To uh, I'm frustrated. I am frustrated, but I don't want to sin in being frustrated. I want to tell the truth but I want to tell it in love and not in bitterness. My hope, my desire is that my brothers and sisters, I don't care from what view of Christianity you come from, that they experience the joy, the peace, the, really, it's, it's euphoria when I understand what Genesis is really saying and how much it's pointing to the work and person of Christ, which could only be true, by the way, if the scripture was divinely inspired and Jesus who is, is he claims to be. So in a sense, it's like a complicated mathematical proof for the existence of, of the God of the Bible. But that's another video. I think I talk about that elsewhere. I think I've made my point here tonight. I appreciate you hanging with me in this. Uh, this is the part where I beg, like, and share. Please do. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you.